Hello, I'm Anne Periston. I would like to talk about two poems, two very short poems. I'll start with the first one, which is The Peace of Wild Things by Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Wendell Berry was born in Kentucky in 1934 and he's a renowned poet and farmer and environmentalist. He's the author of more than 40 works of fiction, non-fiction and poetry and the recipient of numerous awards. The Piece of Wild Things was published first in 1968, which is just over 50 years ago but yet it feels so contemporary and relevant for us at this time. Berry, with considerable foresight, was already well aware of the changes in the environment and of the urgency of the issue, which is now magnified as we face both the effects of climate change and of COVID pandemic. The opening lines speak to us so directly. When despair for the world grows in me, I wake in the night of the least sound the fear of what my life and the lives of my children will be. I think those of us who are both parents and grandparents feel this acutely. More than, much more than for ourselves, we fear for the next generation. Anxiety threatens to overwhelm us. Yet even as these lines resonate, the poet does not permit himself or us as readers to linger there. There's barely a pause, only a comma in fact, before he tells us what he does. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the waters and the great heron feeds. And then he stops and so we stop too. This is the resting place then in nature and once again it resonates with us. Which of us, which of us has not sought to still our beating hearts with walks outdoors? And during lockdown Bird song was experienced with an extraordinary intensity and spring burst forth, it seemed, with a beauty never experienced in quite the same way before. And so nature appeared to offer us consolations in abundance. The poet has a further explanation for this as he explains how he comes into this piece of wild things. Because they are the ones who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. It is the absence of forethought which enables these creatures to be fully present, as children often are, and alive to the moment. But human beings are creatures whose minds wander, who remember the past and often as a burden, and to anticipate the future very often with fears and imaginings. Observing these creatures has the effect of bringing the mind to stillness, of enabling the poet and the reader to be present. And so the next phrase brings the resolution, I come into the presence of still waters. I find, and I'm sure you do too, echoes of Psalm 23 in the movement of the poem. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. The awareness of those surroundings now stretches to include the wider cosmos, as the poet feels above him in that really beautiful phrase, I think, the day blind stars waiting with their light. And of course, as, as they are blind, in a sense, we too are often blind to the light that is possibly there, but just momentarily hidden from us. Because of course the stars only show their light in the darkness and that's precisely when the poet needs it, when we need it. The respite is temporary, it's for a time. 
but it gives a breathing space, literally and metaphorically. And in that time, there is a recalibration and the crippling anxiety diminishes and the tight bands around the chest loosen. The heart beats calmly once more. And the poet concludes, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. And we note how that despair for the world with which the poem opened has become the grace of the world. We don't hold the whole responsibility. We can be open, aware of what is wrong, but open to the grace. So not only do I find echoes of Psalm 23, but also of Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Which one of you, being anxious, can add one cubit to the measure of her life? The poem, like the wild things it describes, restores our souls, brings us to the present moment, which is the only moment that we have in which we can live. And it opens us, even in these most challenging times, to the possibility of grace. If Wendell Berry offers us the peace and solace of the natural world, I want to turn to a poet who brings something very different, but I think also very relevant to this time. And his piece is entirely about the human person. It's called Nursing Home. Nursing Home. Nay, Tibby Supersis, don't outlive yourself. Panic or break a hip or spit puree at the staff at the end of gender, never a happy ending. Yet, in the pastel light of indoors, there is a lady who has distilled to love beyond the fall of memory. She sits holding hands with an ancient woman who calls her brother and George as bees summarise the garden. Les Murray was an Australian poet who died in 2019 at the age of 80. He had a unique voice, at home with the vernacular, the pastoral, the humorous, and perhaps more unusually, the religious. All his poems were dedicated to the glory of God. And as one obituary put it, his poems are both witness and prayer. I find all these elements in this short lyric poem. The opening is light-hearted, humorous. Nay, to be super says, don't outlive yourself. Almost like another version of don't get beyond yourself. Then follow other instructions. Don't panic, don't break a hip, don't spit puree at the staff. And then follow by this rhyming couplet tossed in at the end of gender, never a happy ender. But the second stanza starts with yet. And so we're alerted for the change in theme and tone. The almost comedic scene has shifted to something serious, even sacred. Yet in the pastel light of indoors, there is a lady. It's a new setting. I see an interior, almost like a Dutch still life, in these still figures. Or is it an Annunciation scene, the pastel light, the lady? And then we have the description of this lady who has distilled to love beyond the fall of memory. The shift is complete. The view in the first stanza is of some elderly people, probably suffering from dementia. They have all the frailties of age and someone from outside is wagging their finger, reminding them of how to behave. But here we have a very different view of the same scene. We might even call it the God's eye view. The physical and mental frailties are not what is noted. Instead, we see someone who has become all that the human person is meant to be in their essence. She is distilled to love. Everything else is stripped away. And now in the final vulnerabilities of her life, she is nothing but love. 
she is beyond the fall of memory. And as she sits holding hands with another ancient wise one who calls her brother and George, we get a poignant reference back to the end of gender. It's not relevant here. One person gives solace to another. And of course, there is even poignancy in the fact that they are holding hands, something we're no longer permitted to do. And then there's that final and startling line, as bees summarise the garden. We have in that word summarised both the sound of summer here and a surprising way of describing the activities of the bees as they gather in all the sweetness of the flowers, which will later be distilled to the gold of honey. The poem itself is an act of distillation and summary. And the light in that room, which we observed at the beginning, has changed utterly. The poem is an epiphany. I chose this exquisite, small, so very human poem, almost as an act of reparation, as a riposte to those awful statistics about the deaths of residents in nursing homes during the current pandemic. There is something in these few lines which reminds us of the sacred core of the heart of every human person. And the poem does this precisely because the humour in the first lines draws us in. This is not even borderline sentimental. The poet knows and is aware of the vicissitudes of age. They are not denied. But he sees beyond the appearances of decrepitude. There is that yet. And we are invited too to see more, to transcend those things, to see the essence, the distillation to love. As the bees summarise the garden.